Okay, uh, quick review. We're in chapter two, but I always like to kind of back up and, and redo a little bit of what we did before. In chapter one, verses three through 14, Paul, he praises God for his work in Christ and says a lot of uh, things that I think are just really uh, amazing and powerful. Then in chapter one, verses 15 to 23, he reports his prayer for the recipients, the, as I see it, the Gentile Christians in Asia Minor. But he tells them his prayer for them, and then he elaborates on it in light of Christ's exaltation. This is his prayer report. He tells them that, and then he, he elaborates on that prayer, given what God has done uh, uh, to and for Christ and in Christ. He says in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1 that because they've been included in Christ with all that that entails... He never ceases to give thanks for them when he mentions them in his prayers. And then he says in 17 through the first part of 19 that he's praying that the eyes of their hearts may be enlightened, that they may know several things. They may know at a deep internal level several things. He's praying that their eyes, their heart may be enlightened so they may know what is the hope of God's calling. And then as I see it, he specifies what that is. He elaborates on it. What is the hope of God's calling that is what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance among the saints? And he prays that they may grasp at a heart level what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And then he elaborates on that. He elaborates in verses 19 through 21, the second part of 19 through 21. He elaborates on his prayer in light of Christ's exaltation. He says the power that God has exercised toward Christians and that is available to them is similar to, is analogous to, is in accordance with the power that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his, at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You have this analogy or this parallel. And then he says in verse 22, he adds that the one under whose feet God has subjected all things was given in that position to the church. And so I made the point last week that the church will, will never fail to accomplish God's purpose. No power will ever thwart God's purpose. There will not be a situation where we'll wind up on that day and God will say, well, what do you know? I was trumped by a greater power. Okay, this will never happen. And so he makes that point. Then he says in verse 23 of chapter 1 that the church is the body and fullness of Christ. And I, as I said last week, Paul prays this. He wants this enlightenment of their hearts because of the devotional consequences. In other words, he knows that he's praying that this because this will feed into how they live today. It will strengthen them in the battle in this overlap of ages. As you know, they're being persecuted or whatever is going on. All that happens in a Christian life, we need strength. And he's saying, listen, if you will get a grip at a heart level on these things, it will help you. When we, we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once walked according to this worldly age, according to the ruler of the domain of the air, the spirit now working among the sons of disobedience. We all also once lived among them in the lusts of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and we, like the rest, were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, so that he might show in the coming ages the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from works so that no one may boast." We are his product or his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared in advance in order that we should walk in them. Okay, we, we talked about the first three verses last week. So let me just mention that and then we'll get down to verses 4 through 7. But Paul says that as, as Christ had been physically dead as a result of having been crucified, they had been spiritually dead. Uh, as a result of their sins, they were, they were spiritually dead, meaning they were alienated or separated from God, that because of their sins. And so Christ was dead physically from crucifixion. They were dead spiritually because of their, their sins. And that, uh, you know, God here, here they were that, that, there's this parallel. Okay, there's this parallel. They were like that, and Christ was dead, and he was raised. They were spiritually dead, 
and they were raised and exalted in, a, in an analogy with what was done for Christ. And they were separated uh, because of the transgressions and sins. Their living that way was in conformity with this worldly age. Okay, they were living in conformity with this worldly age, which is also living in conformity with the ruler of the domain of the air. They were, they were acting out, living that way. The spirit who's now working among the sons of disobedience, they were in step with him. He is opposed to God. They were living in accordance with this worldly age. They were in step with the ruler of the domain of the air, this, the one who's now at work in the sons of disobedience. So they were in rebellion, living for themselves, living apart from God. And Paul and all the other Christians, he says, also lived in disobedience, carrying out the desires and thoughts of their fallen natures, desires and thoughts that are contrary to God's will. He's in that boat. He says, we were all like that. And as a result of disobedience, they, like all mankind, they were what? They were justly under God's condemnation. Okay, and that's an important little side point, is that all people who are condemned are condemned justly. You see, because all people have sinned and rejected God and gone against God, general revelation is sufficient to make sin culpable. You know, so people say, what about these people who didn't hear about this or something? You say, well, all people have sufficient knowledge of God to make their sin culpable, guilty. So he's saying, Paul says, look, we live that way. We lived in in rebellion to God and we were justly under God's wrath. That's how we live. Now we'll look at verses 4 through 7. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in transgressions, made us alive with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, so that he might show in the coming ages the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. See, as God raised Jesus physically from death, right, he took Jesus from this horrible position of death, this, the worst death, the most shameful death you could die. He takes him from that depth. He exerts his power and he raises Jesus and seats him with him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Well, so he in his rich mercy, through his great love for us, exercised analogous power by raising us from spiritual death and seating us with Christ at his right hand. Now he's talking figuratively here. He has raised us up spiritually, that he's reconciled us, and he has exalted us by having us be his children. So we have an exalted status. What was your status before? Well, I was dead. I was alienated from God. What has he done through his power? He has taken you and raised you to spiritual life and exalted you with Christ in that he has given you the status of his children. So we have gone from some position to now where are we? Okay, we are, we are extremely exalted. When we entered into union with Christ, when we became in Christ, okay, when we entered into union with Him, we in God's sight entered into union with what He had done for Christ. Okay, He says that we were made alive together with Christ and raised and seated together with Him. So there's some sense that we share in that our present exaltation as children of God, we are, we are sharing in some sense in what God has done for Christ. Okay, he took us and raised us from death. We share in Christ's resurrection and exaltation in that sense. But there is a sense in which our sharing in that resurrection and exaltation will be fulfilled. We share in it now. Remember all the stuff I talked about, the now and the not yet, the already and the not yet. The tension between the overlap of ages. Well, you see that here. We are raised from the dead spiritually in that spiritual death as alienation from God has been healed, we've been reconciled, we've been raised spiritually, and we've been exalted in that we've been made his children. But there is a sense in the not, the not yet, there's a greater sense in which we will participate in Christ's resurrection and exaltation on that day. On that day we'll participate fully in it in that we will be resurrected ourselves. And we will share in that status, that exalted status in our position in heaven, in, in the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so you get this idea where he says, listen, that you, you have, you've had this in a figurative sense where it, it, in, you are exalted with Christ 
You have been healed already. You have been reconciled. Your spiritual death. But there is a fuller sense awaiting you. Okay, fuller sense awaiting you. Now, Paul stresses that this is all what? It's all God's work. Okay, it's all, all God's work. It's because of His great mercy and love that we've been blessed this way. It's not because of us. And you have to remind yourself of that constantly. God's amazing rescue in Christ of those who were dead... Okay, was what? Was so that, what's behind this? He says it was so that the church, this society of pardoned rebels, to use uh, Bruce's phrase, it was so that the church would throughout time and eternity serve as a witness to the surpassing richness of his grace. We as a redeemed people, rescued people, Okay, this idea of pardoned rebels. We are a society of pardoned rebels. What message do we proclaim through eternity? We proclaim through eternity, look at what an amazing God he is. It is through his grace. We are a showcase of God's mercy. We're a showcase of what he does. Who are these people? Well, they're a showcase of God's mercy. Mercy and grace. Look what he has done. He has taken these people and he has redeemed them. And throughout eternity as a community of people, we proclaim that message by our very existence in God's presence. So it's just to me, you know, when he sits here and he says, so that, so that the church would throughout time and eternity serve as a witness to the surpassing riches of his grace. Here's what Peter O'Brien says. He says, the apostles thought in verses 4 through 7, has gone full circle. He began by speaking of God's mercy and love as the motivation for his initiative in saving his people, verse 4. Paul then drew the reader's attention to the mighty rescue which arose out of God's gracious action, verse 5, and he concludes by declaring that God's lavishing his mercy on rebels is to serve as a demonstration of his grace for all succeeding ages. What God has done for those in Christ is a reality, but only in the coming ages will it be fully seen for what it is. In the light of God's gracious saving work, believers point men and women from themselves to the one to whom they owe their salvation. You see, we are a rescue project. And so our existence redounds to the glory of whom? God. Our very existence is to his glory. Because it is through his effort, his work, his mercy, his love that we are here and that we stand before him. Okay, that is, that's, it's so important to see that. That our very existence is something that uh, is because of his work and grace. In verses 8 through 10, Paul emphasizes again that their move from death to life, okay, and their exaltation with Christ was not due to any human effort. I mean, he's just stressing this, right? He says, for by grace you've been saved. And this is not from you. It's not from you. And it's tempting to think it is from you. Because it's tempting to think, I'm clever enough to have figured this out. I'm better than these other people. If they had half my moral fiber, they too would be here. But they don't, you see. And it's because I'm better. It is because of who I am. That's a temptation. Okay, and the the attitude and the perspective, see, that Paul is saying, you have to understand that you are where you are. You are God's work. You are God's product. You know that line about, you know, Christians just being one beggar showing another where bread is? See, that perspective and understanding that is very important. And so Paul is emphasizing it and stressing it here in verses 8 through 10. We've been saved by grace, by God's unmerited favor which we simply accepted through faith. And I went through a couple weeks ago talking about the idea of viewing faith as some kind of, as a meritorious thing is not the right way to see it. You know, faith is simply allowing God to rescue us. It's not fighting Him. It's simply saying, okay, accepting what God is doing in your life. Our salvation is not something we achieve in any way. It is a gift of God, pure and simple. Now that's what Paul is saying, and I don't know how that strikes you. Sometimes it rubs our pride to say, what do you mean? It's a gift of God, pure and simple. I want to take some, uh, I want to take some uh, you know, pride in this thing. And he's saying, listen, you have to see 
It is by God's grace that He's given you. We're in, we in no way gain salvation by our efforts, so we have absolutely no grounds to boast about it. You see, he says, not from works so that no one may boast. Well, if I did something, if I'm gaining it, if it's because of my wisdom, my cleverness, my goodness, or anything, I say, well, see, look, this is why, see, I'm up over on you because you are too stupid or too immoral or this and that. You see, but he does it. He says, no, you can't boast about anything. All you can do is just sit there and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise you for your mercy that you saved a wretch like me. And so it's important that Paul stresses it and he wants them to see it. We are God's product, the result of his work. God has created us anew in Christ and through Christ. And so Brian's words, and I like it, he's created us anew in Christ and through Christ. We're part of the new creation that's already invaded this present age in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And God's intention is that we as participants in the new creation, we should live in accordance with that status. What are we? The new age, okay? This time has invaded this world. That's why I went through all that stuff. We are a new creation. We already participate in the new creation, and now we're to live consistently with that status. That's what God wants from us. We're to live as people of the coming age, which is already broken in. You see, we're not like the world. We're not to live like the world. Why? Because we're a new creature. We already participate in what has come in and what has invaded this, this present. Okay, so it's an important thing that we are to live. And he's going to spend several chapters, chapter 4, 5, and 6, laying out, well, what are the ethical consequences of your redemption? Your participation in this new age, in the here and now. What does that mean for how you're to be? Okay, it is very important to get the foundation. The foundation is God has rescued you. God has saved you. This is by grace, not by work so that you can't boast about it. But it has ethical consequences. We cannot stop teaching people that Christ calls us to live a certain way out of fear that in doing that, someone will think, well, you're teaching a work salvation. I can explain. There is a difference. So I won't be muzzled and saying, well, I don't want to ever talk about your responsibility as a Christian, how you are to live, the call to holiness. Paul won't stop talking about it. He's going to preach it. And we have to do it. Okay, we have to do it. But we understand that we do it and it is a consequence of what has been given to us. Because we are participants in the new life, we're new creatures we have a responsibility to live a certain way. And we call one another to that new life. Okay, we call one another to live this way. We're to, we're to, to be this way. Here's, here's how O'Brien says. You can tell I like a lot of stuff O'Brien says. He says, there are important ethical consequences of our being God's new creation, created in Christ Jesus. The divine intention forcefully expressed by the purpose clause is that we should walk in good deeds. We have a responsibility to live in the world so as to please Him. There was a time when we walked in disobedience and sin, followed the ways of this world, were in terrible bondage to the devil, and were destined for wrath. But now, because of God's mighty salvation in which a glorious change has been effected, we are expected through the agency of His Holy Spirit to demonstrate a changed lifestyle. Our attitudes and behavior are to show all the hallmarks of the new creation. And when we walk in these ways which are according to his purpose, it is he himself who is powerfully working in our lives. We are new creatures. He is transforming us. We live different lives. You should be able to point back to your life. Okay? And say, listen, there was a time here. Now, if you were raised and you were converted early, maybe not. You were always part of the community in that sense. But you see, there is a call where I went from this way, I was living this way, and now I live a new life. You cannot break, you cannot separate the call to holiness from being a Christian. You can't pull it out and simply say, oh, no. You're all wet, you see. I understand that I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by grace through faith, not by works. 
So I live any way I want. That's crazy. That's not biblical faith at all. And we are called to be radically righteous and make no apology for it. Okay, does that mean when we fail in that, that we browbeat people who are sincere? And sh- no. But on the other side, it doesn't mean that we throw out the call to holiness because we're afraid it's going to make some people feel inadequate. Okay, we all feel inadequate. Right? But we understand that we are to call one another. Call one another. Be right. Be holy. Live this way. And he's going to spend three chapters doing it. Okay, four, five, and six. But even here you see what he's after. You see what he's talking about. You see that there is this call to holiness. Now, I want to get on here in chapter, verses 11 through 22. Now here he calls him to remember God's saving work from a specifically Gentile perspective. Now there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, so I don't know how far we'll get, but we're going to take a, a slug at it. Let me read the section. He says, therefore remember that at one time... You, the Gentiles in the flesh, those called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision done by hands in the flesh, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who at one time were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. The one who has made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall, which is the fence, having set aside in his flesh the hostility, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that he might create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, having put to death in himself the hostility." And having come, he proclaimed peace to you, those who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Accordingly, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself, in whom the entire building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a place where God dwells in the Spirit. All right, a lot here. Given that God had graciously saved them in Christ, he's he's explained that. He's talked about how, look, God has rescued you. It's his work. He has done this. Now, given that they've been graciously saved in Christ, he calls them to reflect on their prior spiritual condition as Gentiles. He wants them to really think about, look, think about what you were spiritually as Gentiles. And he wants them to do that so they may have an even greater appreciation of the mighty reversal God has effected on their behalf. He wants them to see. You remember when he's praying, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. He wants them to see, appreciate what has been done for you. There is tremendous power in looking back and recognizing, whew, Look where I was. Look at my condition. Look at the hopelessness. Look at the, you know, where I was and what has God done? Ah, where are you now? And why are you there? I am blessed beyond measure. Why? Because of him. It is because of God. So that's what he wants them to see, okay? Why? He wants them to have a greater grip and appreciation of what God has given them. So he says, listen, Chew for a while on your specific situation as a Gentile. He notes that they were Gentiles in the flesh. Okay, here he's talking about reference specifically to a physical bodily difference between them and the Jews. Okay, he's talking specifically about a circumcision. See, they were physically uncircumcised in contrast to the Jews who were physically circumcised. You were Gentiles in the flesh in that sense. You were not circumcised. They're Jews in the flesh in the sense they are circumcised. Okay, so he tells them, look, you were Gentiles in the flesh, and as circumcision was a physical sign of Israel's covenant with God, their uncircumcision was evidence that they were outside of Israel's relationship with God. So listen, you were outside that relationship. God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was working through and with the people of Israel, you weren't part of that. Remember that. When you're thinking about what has God done for you, remember that as Gentiles you were outside of that. And then he lists some deficiencies or inadequacies uh, 
of their pre-Christian uh, past so that they might appreciate more deeply the blessings they've received in Christ. He works on these things. Why? See your situation, and we could benefit from that. What were you before Christ saved you? How were you living? Where was your life? What was your state with God? What has he done for you? It's so easy to forget. And we have to remember what was the state we were in so we can praise him. Keep that fresh. And that's what he's asking them to do. Well, he, he lists some deficiencies or inadequacies in their pre-Christian past. He says they were separate from Christ. Okay, separate from the Messiah in the sense they had no part in Israel's messianic expectation. Okay, they were outside of that messianic expectation. Israel expected a Messiah. They expected a coming king, someone to sit on David's throne in fulfillment of God's purposes because the scriptures that had been entrusted to them, for example, in Romans 3.23, you can see that, because the scriptures, see, that had been entrusted to Israel, they spoke of this Messiah, but the Gentiles, they weren't plugged into that expectation. Okay, they weren't, they weren't part of that because that was something that was part of Israel. Israel had God's scriptures. They had a messianic expectation. The Gentiles, who cares? What are these crazy people thinking? Okay, so he tells them, look, they were separate from Christ. They were not part of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, and thus they weren't party to the various covenants that God had made with Israel based on his foundational promised blessings to Abraham. He had made covenants with Israel. Okay, they weren't part of that. They were outside of that. They were outside the line of promise and being apart from Israel... And thus being outside the line of promise, they were prior to their conversion, they were without hope of participating, participating in the blessings of that promise. Okay, so they not, only, they not only were separate from Christ in a subjective sense of being unaware or uninterested in the Messiah, so they were apart from him in that subjective sense of the Messiah's promised coming as revealed in Israel's scriptures, they were also without hope in an objective sense. They were in a bad state. Subjectively, they were, they were apart from the messianic blessings. Objectively, they were outside the promises of Israel's messianic salvation. They weren't part of that. So he's saying, think about where you were. This was your situation. They were without God in the world. In the sense that they had no part of the true God. They had all kinds of gods. But they had no part in the true God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Jesus. They had no part in that. Okay, they were off in their own little thing. So he's saying, think of where you were, Gentiles, before your conversion. This was their dire state. But now, they are in, they in Christ. What's their situation now? Is look where you were. You had all of these things. You had all of these deficiencies, all of these inadequacies. That's where you were. But now that you're in Christ, you've been brought near through Christ's atoning death. You were over here alienated outside the hope, outside the expectation, outside the line of promise, but now, Christ, you've been brought near. You've been brought near through his atoning death. In Christ, they've come to know Israel's Messiah. They have come to participate in God's promises to Israel, and they have a relationship with the true and living God. Those inadequacies and those deficiencies that were theirs by virtue of their Gentile state have all been taken away in Christ. And what do we say? We say, praise God. Right? That, I mean, that, you know, that's us. Right? We're grafted in. We are grafted in, and I praise God for it. See, that was how they were. And then in verses 14 through 18, well, 13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who at one time were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups... Jew and Gentile, one, and broke down the dividing wall, which is the fence, having set aside in his flesh the hostility, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that he might create himself one new man out of the two, thus make, making peace, and might reconcile both to God. See, the Gentiles had been brought near in Christ Jesus, because Christ Jesus is the one who created peace between Jews and Gentiles, the one who unified them. Jews and Gentiles, you have to get an idea of how, what a gulf there was in the ancient world between these folks. 
Uh, Andrew Lincoln in his commentary says, in accomplishing this, Christ has transcended one of the fundamental divisions of the first century world. Okay, Jews and Gentiles, this was a huge sociological gulf. Okay, there was a huge divide between them, tremendous animosity between them. And Christ has done what? He has brought them together in one. Jew and Gentile, he's brought them together in one. Now the same is true of all different groups in the church. You see that in Galatians 3, 26 through 28. But Paul's focus here is on Jews and Gentiles. Jesus Christ has brought Jewish and Gentile believers together in one body. And the unification of Jewish and Gentile believers into one body was achieved by his setting aside the Mosaic law, which was accomplished through his sacrifice on the cross. On the cross. Okay, I want to explore this a bit because this is... Uh, I think it's, it, it's interesting, but I think it's important. The law here, it's referred to the dividing wall, which is the fence. Okay, the hostility and the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. O'Brien says, he says, the law separated Jews and Gentiles both religiously and sociologically and caused deep-seated hostility. The enmity which, is, which was caused by the Jews' separateness was often accompanied by a sense of superiority on their part. You see, the law was something, the Mosaic law that was given was something that distinguished Jews from Gentiles in a number of senses. Okay, it separated them in a number of senses. It separated, distinguished them in the broad sense that it defined a special relationship between God and Israel. Okay, God is working through the people of Israel. He chose them for a special role in his unfolding plan of redemption. So you have that just from the sense of the law itself, but specific commandments also, they produce almost complete separation from Gentiles. You have all of these commandments. See, God's people, they couldn't intermarry. Okay? Why? Well, kept isolated. You see it in Deuteronomy 7, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 13. They couldn't marry Gentiles. Okay, so that's one of the things that keeps them apart. But you also have these extensive regulations defining uncleanness, ritual uncleanness, all throughout the, the law of Moses that kept them apart from Gentiles. You had these regulations about involvement with certain animals, involvement with certain foods, involvement with bleeding, corpses, graves. Okay, all of these things created a tremendous separation from Gentiles it resulted in separation from these unclean, non-complying Gentiles. Okay, you see in Galatians chapter 2, verse 12, for example, Leviticus and Numbers. What else? I can't go hang with a Gentile. He's unclean. Why? Because he doesn't pay attention to all of these things that we have, these ritual rules about cleanliness. So I can't have anything to do with them. Well, what happens when people segregate, when they keep to themselves? What is, what is one of the th things that flows out of it? Well, there was great hostility that grew up. The Gentiles were hostile toward the Jews. The Jews were hostile toward the Gentiles. And the Jews, in fact, thought they were superior. Okay, so there was this great gulf that Lincoln can say this was one of the fundamental divisions of the first century world. It's hard for us to understand that. But we have our own very deep fundamental divisions, don't we, in society. We have very deep fundamental divisions. And he's saying that Christ took the deepest, most fundamental division in the first century world and he brought them together as one in Jesus Christ. Now, do you remember the thing about in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10? What is the ultimate deal about the cosmic reconciliation? Do you see this reconciling in the church as the now aspect of the not yet cosmic reconciliation that Jesus is bringing about? He's reconciling all things, and in the church, Jew and Gentile together is part of that. It is the now aspect of that. And you could say that about every other group. The deeper the divisions, the deeper the hostility between the groups, the greater Christ's work in bringing the, them together as one in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's why it is absolutely insane for racism to exist in churches. Okay, now I've, you know, my daughter was somewhere years ago, 
And I forget what, the, what was said, but something was said that, uh, you know, it was just absurd. And yet this is tolerated, was tolerated. Okay, is tolerated. Well, it's crazy. It is working contrary to this fundamental purpose that you see spelled out here. So see, what, it, what is wonderful, what praises God is when you have groups that are typically hostile to one another, united because of this transcendent commitment to Jesus Christ so that we are all brothers and sisters. Okay, red, yellow, black, and white, precious in his sight. Okay, so see, when you see, in a, when, what does that say to the world? He says, what is going on that Jews and Gentiles are together as brothers and sisters? I thought they hated each other. Going back a real long time. Ah, what's happened? Jesus Christ has brought them together as one, as the foretaste of his reconciling work that will be consummated when the cosmos is brought to peace. You see, ah, I, I just, this stuff to me, I told Meg, there's just stuff in here that's, uh, it's just wild, deep, you know, uh, I like it. Okay. Now, he said this unification it, it, uh, into one body, it has to do with this doing away with the Mosaic Law. And I want to spend a little bit of time here. I only got six minutes, but I'll see what I can say in that. The law, it's, it's, it's this thing where you have, it's a source of this division. Now, originally, I'm suspecting that what happened, you see, well, let me read to you the, the words of 2nd century B.C., the Epistle of Aristeus, so you can, you can see the extent of separation here. He writes, our lawgiver fenced us about with impenetrable palisades and with walls of iron to the end that we should mingle in no way with any of the other nations. Okay, so you have that now. The Mosaic Law, all right, the Mosaic Law is a, it's a set or package of commands. It is a body of commands. If you can think of, it's a library of commands. You have to see it as a unit. Okay, it is a set or package of commands that were part of the Mosaic Covenant. All right, now, moral law existed before Sinai, right? I mean, you had moral law. I mean, the, the, the flood of Noah. That bears solemn witness to the fact that there was moral law before Sinai. Okay, but, but the Mosaic law was to that point the grandest expression of God's moral law, God's moral requirements, but they didn't begin there. Okay, now some of the commandments of the Mosaic Covenant, that part of the Mosaic Law, the commands that are associated with that, that set or package of commands, some of those commands were peculiarly covenantal. Okay, they were peculiarly covenantal, they, meaning they weren't part of the universal moral desires of God. Okay, they didn't exist before, he made them here as part of Israel, and they don't have ongoing applicability to us. We recognize that in a number of ways. These things, they erected civil and ceremonial or ritualistic amoral distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. You say, well, why did he do that? I, I, I suspect it was to keep them separate from the Gentiles so they wouldn't be tainted and fall into the things. and fall, <laughs> They wouldn't be tainted and fall into these practices in order to help them serve as a witness to the Gentile neighbors of the blessed life that exists under God. Okay, so you had these things here, you have these, these uh, ritualistic, you have these uh, civil things that are part of the Mosaic Covenant, and then the new covenant that's instituted by God in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the effect of that was to render what? It was to ren render the old Mosaic Covenant obsolete. So we have a covenant that includes within it a certain package of commandments, and then we have a new covenant which renders that one obsolete. And with the rendering of that old covenant, that Mosaic covenant obsolete, it rendered the law that was tied to that covenant obsolete. That is the law we are not under. It is the Mosaic law. We sometimes get the idea that there are no moral requirements and the fact that there's a moral requirement that somehow that is sub-Christian. There are moral requirements all over. Paul's going to turn around in Ephesians 6, 2 and say, what? Obey your father and mother. Was he being sub-Christian? No. You see, you have to see that you have this set. It is the set of commands that have, that have expired or fulfilled their purpose 
in the planned obsolescence of the Mosaic Covenant. When the new covenant comes, that covenant is gone, and therefore those laws, that set of commandments that were tied to it, they also are gone. With the fulfillment of Christ's planned obsolescence, the Mosaic Covenant, that set of commandments, the Mosaic Law, okay, that is uh, uh, ceased to be binding. And you can see that it ceased to be binding in a number of places. But you know this. You can see that it ceased to be binding in Romans 10, 1 through 4. Galatians 3, 23 through 25. Hebrews 7, 11 through 14. But you can also see that it ceased to be binding from the, from the fact that specific requirements in that law are no longer binding. Sabbath, circumcision, food laws. You say, well, what happened? They were part of the Mosaic law, but they're no longer binding. Okay, well, that's because that law as a set of commandments is no longer binding. That's why Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 9.20, as a Jew, he could declare that he wasn't under the Mosaic law. Is Paul somebody who doesn't urge moral requirements on people? Of course he urges moral requirements on people. But he's not under the Mosaic law because that law was tied to the covenant that is now obsolete. It was embedded in that covenant. It is that set or package of commands. Now, though the set of commands that constitute the Mosaic law cease to be binding, many of the individual commands, many of the individual books in that library, so to speak, that were included in that Mosaic law, they have ongoing or renewed applicability and indeed find their full expression in the new covenant. That's why I said Paul, after saying this, can turn around in 6.2 and say, honor your father and mother, right out of the Ten Commandments. So you say, well, wait a minute, Paul, I thought there was no law. No, it's the set. You see, it is the set. So you say, some of these things, you see, they come through. And they have renewed applicability, and they find their full expression. The fundamental ethical requirement for the Christian, I wish I had more time to do this, but we'll just have to stop here. I'll talk till the bell rings. Look, the fundamental ethical requirement for the Christian is love. That's the bullseye. That's the center. Okay, you see that in Matthew 7, 12, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, Romans 13, 8 through 10, Galatians 5, 14. <sighs> All right, thanks for coming. We'll pick back up next week. <laughs>